So today I wanna to talk about treatments for glaucoma. Now, if you've been diagnosed with glaucoma and wanna know how you got to that point, I do have a video on how we diagnose glaucoma more broadly. So I recommend you check that out first. But let's say that you are considering the commencement of treatment for glaucoma or are already undergoing a treatment regimen. I just wanna learn more about what it is that you're taking and what the steps might be. So as I mentioned in the previous video, glaucoma is a characteristic thinning and damage to the optic nerve within the eyeball, often due to pressure, but pressure is kind of the only way that we actually treat glaucoma today. We really don't have the tools yet to either reverse the damage or kind of affect the nerve tissue directly. We just eliminate the stressors on the nerve and the main stress is pressure within the eye. So most of the modalities that we discuss when it comes to treatment of pressure or treatment of glaucoma are focused on treatment of pressure itself and lowering pressure. Now, I also mentioned that you could have high pressures and not have glaucoma, or you can have low pressures and have glaucoma, and that's called normotensive glaucoma. But still, even despite all that, we typically try to lower the pressure as low as possible. Now, there are some floors to pressure. As I mentioned, average pressures or normal pressures are between 10 and 21 millimeters of mercury. But the lower end of that pressure is kind of limited by the kind of what we call the episcleral venous pressure, which is the basic circulation of the blood flow where the aqueous drains into the trabecular meshwork and ultimately into Schlem's canal and your venous system. There is a back pressure in the veins that kind of limits the amount of drainage period. So really pressures below eight, seven or eight are really not possible. And if your pressure gets too low, like four or five millimeters of mercury, that's a problem too, that's called hypotony. That means that the support within the eye starts to get compromised and the eye can kind of collapse on itself and that's not good either. Similarly, the higher the pressure, the greater the risk on the optic nerve. So if your pressures are 25, that's not great, but that's better than being 35 or 40. So the rate of vision loss is proportionate to pressure and it kind of goes up exponentially. In other words, pressures in the 20s can take decades to really cause problems. Pressures in the 30s can cause damage in years. Pressures in the 40s, weeks to months, and pressures in the 50s or 60s, days or hours. So, you know, that's why we really do want to check to see where you are starting from and where your pressure is now so we know how aggressively we need to treat it. On the flip side, let's say you have high pressures, but you're on the older side. Let's say you're in your 80s and 90s, God bless you, and you basically have high pressures. We may not need to be as aggressive because, you know, odds are you might not outlive your glaucoma. So in that situation, we get, you know, real concern for patients that are on the younger side and less concerned if you're older. In fact, there is a natural pattern of visual field loss uh, related to glaucoma because the odds are that pressure over time will cause some problems. So nonetheless, the approach for treatment of glaucoma is usually centered around lowering the pressure within the eye. So what are the common things that we do to lower the pressure? Well, the most common thing is eye drops. And eye drops are basically applied once, twice, or even three times a day to either suppress what's called the aqueous production or the amount of fluid being made by the ciliary epithelium that produces the fluid or increase the drainage of the trabecular meshwork or accessory structures that allow the fluid to kind of you know, flow out more quickly. So just like when I think about dry eyes, I think about fluid balances, right? So if the fluid level is too high within the eye, then we can either turn down the faucet or the amount of production with eye drops, or we can increase the amount of drainage, and that's often done also with eye drops or other methods like lasers or surgery. Now, in addition to eye drops, which deliver medicine by basically putting the eye drop on the eye and letting it absorb it in the eye, there are now drug delivery systems that can be done in the office or in the surgery center that can basically create a sustained release environment where the drug is implanted through a tiny little pellet and that pellet kind of dissolves with time releasing the medicine slowly. And there are two basic products now that provide that type of treatment and this will constantly change as time goes on but one of them is Darista and the other is Eidos. And both of them kind of release medicine slowly into the eye so that you are less responsible for putting drops in every day and we know that you're getting a regulated and consistent 
consistent dosage throughout the day, which is really helpful for compliance and pressure control. Now, there are many different classes of medicines and we'll kind of talk about that in another video as well. But basically each different class has different side effect profiles and different purposes when it comes to topical eye drop pressure controlling medications. Um, and those different classes, whether it's prostaglandins or beta blockers or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, they all kind of are used in different ways. So talk with your doctor about which one might be appropriate for you. But typically we'll start with a prostaglandin because it's very well tolerated and really good efficacy. And that's usually dosed once a day as well. So for all those reasons, usually prostaglandins are first in line. That is going to be latanoprost or anything with a prost at the end, like travoprost. But they do cause some redness and they can cause some pigmentary changes if you have light greenish or hazel eyes. Um, so that's something to be aware of and it can affect other things. But we'll, we'll go into more detail about different drops and side effects in another video. But just know that the most common way that we treat eye pressure is with eye drops or drug delivery. The second most common way, and sometimes this is done first line, is lasers. And these lasers are used again in different ways depending on the subtype of glaucoma. But if you have closed angle glaucoma, or basically where the natural access of the fluid to the trabecular mesh is compromised, then we do what's called a laser peripheral iridotomy or LPI. And this creates a little tunnel or hole in the periphery of the iris that allows fluid to have a back channel of egress so that if the trabecular meshwork isn't accessible, there is another way for the fluid to circulate. And this is done in emergency situations where the pressure suddenly rises for angle closure glaucoma, or it's done as prophylaxis or prevention if you have other anatomic risk, risk factors for angle closure, meaning that on your exam, the doctor is suspicious that you might not have natural outflow access, so we'll put a little hole in as a protective measure. And once that's done, it's done. So that's a good thing, as long as it stays open and patent, and that does require an exam to kind of maintain and look to make sure that that little hole or that LPI is open. Once it's there and once it's open, you should be good to go. The second laser that we use is called an SLT or selective laser trabeculoplasty. And this works in a different way. We don't truly understand, at least I don't understand fully how it works, but the idea is that it kind of stimulates your body's natural mechanisms for cleaning and maintaining the trabecular meshwork. Think of it like a sponge. The water needs to absorb it in the sponge, but there's a lot of debris and kind of gunk or, you know, you know, cells or, or, or byproducts as time goes on, or if the trabecular restrict isn't functioning properly and those little holes in the sponges are blocked, then the SLT kind of opens those little holes and pores and it also works really well. Typically it can last months to years, up to five years in some patients. Both of these lasers are done very quickly, usually with minimal pain or discomfort, you know, it takes about five minutes or so. But basically we just apply a thin layer of laser energy along the edge of the trabecular meshwork and little bubbles are created here and that tells us that the energy has been absorbed and then we know that that you know then we watch you to see how you respond this typically works for about four to five patients on average um, we can get some spikes in pressure after the procedure so we often control that with steroids or other um, inflammatory regulators and sometimes we continue on your eye drops during the course of healing after the SLT but this is another great option if you have open angle glaucoma and can tolerate a laser treatment now if drops or lasers aren't getting the job done and let's say you're on multiple drops or have tried lasers or these drug delivery devices and you're not getting the adequate pressure control as deemed appropriate by your doctor, then we usually move to surgery at that point. And we can kind of categorize surgery into what's called MIGS or minimally invasive glaucoma surgery and what is considered full bore or standard care of glaucoma treatment. And these are typically shunts or filters that are put within the eye to increase the space or volume of fluid outflow. So when we think of MIGS, we think of intraocular procedures that are done basically by a surgeon to increase outflow in some way. That basically can be done by creating a little bypass to the trabecular meshwork to the outflow drain. And there's a lot of ways that we can do that. One is with the eye stent um, and that creates a little bit of a kind of little tube that you know goes into the trabecular meshwork and allows the fluid to go out. Or we can literally remove some of the trabecular meshwork and just expose Schlem's canal or the drainage pathway entirely. And that's basically done by a procedure called a goniotomy. There's a lot of different you know tools that are used for that. Or we can basically basically allow fluid to dilate the collecting channels and uh, that can be coupled with the goniotomy that's called a canaloplasty and there's different um, techniques and products that do that as well and different products that do that would be the eye track or the omni and these are really helpful because they can literally send fluid or um, special fluids like viscoelastic into that canal and open everything up such so the collecting channel is more dilated and more accessible for natural fluid out 
workflow. There's also ways to expand the collecting channels within what's called the supraciliary space, which allows for an extra pocket of fluid collection within the eye. There's also some laser technologies that are used to basically almost shock or suppress the production of the ciliary body itself. Um, and that could be done at various stages as well, um, but that is something to be aware of. But again, in that supraciliary space, you have other products like the older generation of Psypass and even newer options that allow fluid to drain into an internal pocket within the eye. And then if none of those work, then we typically move on to kind of more significant filtering procedures that allow for a secondary space for fluid to come out out of the eye. And that means that the fluid no longer is within the normal scleral environment, but actually suprascleral or under the conjunctiva. These are typically categorized as either shunts or filtering procedures. Shunts are usually little implants that create a little bit of a shell and a tube that allows fluid to flow out of the um, internal aspects of the eye under the conjunctiva, and that creates a little bubble or a bleb, and those would be like an Ahmed shunt or a Baravelt shunt. Some of these have little safety mechanisms to regulate pressure so that fluid is not coming out too quickly, leading to the eye to become hypotenus or in a low pressure environment. Or there is the Zen, which is kind of a hybrid between MIGS and a more traditional glaucoma procedure, but that's a tiny little tube made of like a collagen, made of like a gelatin that allows the, uh, it's very flexible, that allows fluid to kind of leak out um, under the surface of the conjunctiva. That can also be helpful and that creates a little bleb in the same way. Um, but sometimes uh, the, the durability of those blebs might not be the same as if you were doing a shunt or some other procedure. And then the big gun, the big daddy surgery is called a trabeculectomy. Um, and this is, uh, or a trab. And this basically creates a little, um, you know, rectangular or trapezoidal little flap along the edge of the iris right outside the cornea, about the edge of the cornea, that uh, basically creates a little pocket of a uh, hole essentially through the trabecular mesh where it allows fluid to egress out of the sclera and under the conjunctiva without any hardware. So that's the nice thing about it. But again, there are other ways that doctors can kind of use hardware to facilitate this. But a trab is kind of the gold standard and something that has been done for a long, long time, but is a very um, kind of complicated procedure to perform and can be a little unpredictable in terms of its long-term um, stability uh, for some patients. So you just be advised that there are certain risks to all of these procedures. Um, some might be more appropriate than others, depending on your condition your age, and the type and status of your glaucoma. But nonetheless, this is just a broad overview of different approaches that we use to treat glaucoma. Um, and I just hope this is a way for you, know, you to kind of get wrap your head around you know, how these treatments are done and why a doctor might, rep you know, might recommend one over the other. And this is not an exhaustive list. There are definitely other things I didn't mention, but this is kind of the broad categories for you to be aware of. I hope this helps understand kind of how your glaucoma might be treated, or if you're embarking on um, a next step in your glaucoma treatment, what your options might be. So thanks again, and I will see you in the next video.